Right, um, look, uh, so many of you are sending me texts on so many aspects uh, of this. Um, but in a practical sense, uh, talking to Andrew Hoggard, a lot has been lost, damage washed away. A lot of impact on, on families, and uh, maybe they're not in ZB's prime catchment uh, audience in Auckland. Uh, maybe they live in small, isolated, rural, old-fashioned New Zealand communities. Um, and as Andrew Hoggard said, your level of insurance is going to impact how you come out of this. Um, but boy, I was thinking, I don't know if there's a 1 to 10 rating for high-risk countries. Um, in the last 10 or 15 years, I imagine New Zealand has climbed up the scale if there is. Joining us now is the um, Chief Executive of the New Zealand Insurance Council, the umbrella body that represents lobbies for, and in some cases speak, speaks collectively for the insurance industry in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> It's Tim Grafton, and we welcome him to the program. Tim, uh, g'day, mate. How are you going? Uh, g'day, Sean. Good, good thanks. All right. Um, uh, who would be an insurance company in New Zealand, Tim? Are we, we're ahead again. <laughs> yeah, we're ahead again, uh, but that's what insurance companies are here for. So, you know, uh, when you need to make a claim, uh, that's when... Uh, you know, the purpose of an insurance company uh, really comes alive. So, uh, yeah, um, we uh, take on the risk and you've got to take the uh, ups and downs as the claims come through. But ultimately, we're there to uh, pay out on claims uh, when they arrive. Yeah. And uh, the big test is now to yeah. get on with it. Yeah. Tim, I know that when Christchurch hit, uh, it was often said we were one of the most insured countries. You know, individuals were highly insured in New Zealand. Uh, and you guys, I, I think it'd be fair to say, uh, you guys had capacity issues in terms of assessors and sh uh, simply processing claims. Are you in a position industry-wide to assess how big an event this is in, in terms of insurance in New Zealand? Oh, look, this is a very big event. Uh, if I could just give you a little bit of a comparison, last year for extreme weather events, we would have received something in the order of about 35,000 claims. Um, from the uh, Auckland anniversary event alone, uh, we'll be uh, heading pretty close to about 50,000 uh, at the moment. Uh, and from Cyclone Gabrielle, well, uh, there'll be uh, you know thousands of claims coming out of that. So uh, we've had two events uh, over a period of a uh, couple of weeks uh, that uh, will dwarf uh, the entire. 2022 and 2022 was the record year for uh, insurance losses from extreme weather events. So to put it in that context, it, it's big. Uh, in terms of Canterbury, um, it, you know, it's cliche to say every event is different. <laughs> Obviously they are. This is flood, it's not earthquake. Um, Canterbury was focused on a fairly small geographic area compared with uh, this event uh, where we have a you know, a lot of remote communities uh, where access issues are going to be really challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, but you, you, you mentioned the sort of supply chain issues. Yeah, all of those uh, uh, matters are going to have to be uh, thought through. And so, you know, getting the right skills and resources in to do the job, getting the right materials in at the right time to do the job, all of those things uh, make it a... Uh, a, a really big challenge ahead, just as Christchurch was as well. Well, Tim, I presume the phones are ringing off the hook. Uh, do, have you instigated special procedures? Can you give people any instruction as to how to make what's a painful process any less painful, any shorter, any administratively uh, easier? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we've been saying consistently uh, take photos of the damage, note the damage, uh, put your health and safety first. So if you've got a turf out uh, food that's had, you know, contaminated water over it, uh, look after, uh, you know, yourself by taking uh, sodden carpet out and stuff like that. Uh, contact your insurer either online or by phone. Now, for some communities that have had no connectivity for, uh, a week or more and are just looking after the bare essentials of life. So advice there is don't panic. When it, it's good for you and as soon as you can, um, get your claims process uh, underway with your insurer. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we've also been advising uh, people that, you know, if you take out house or contents insurance, that one of the benefits that comes out of that is that you do have 
uh, standard um, uh, accommodation allowance for equivalent accommodation. Um, that can go anywhere uh, from about twenty thousand dollars to some policies close to fifty thousand, and uh, you know, using that uh, uh, wisely uh, as to when you can, um, you know, have your house uh, repaired uh, or whatever needs to be done to it, um, then uh, that, that's something to bear in mind. So, getting your claim in if you're in an uninhabitable house. Uh, really important to get that one underway. Okay, well, Tim, uh, Tim, the other side of that is you guys have got to pick up the phone and, and you've got to respond quickly. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I know after Christchurch there was criticism about the timeliness of responses and, and the processing yeah. of claims. Uh, yeah. Are New Zealand insurance companies ready for this? Um, and are they going to be oh. able to handle the volume of claims in a timely manner? Well, you know, the question is timely uh, and our experience through catastrophes and we've, as you said, had a fair few over the last uh, 10 or 12 years is that, uh, you know, people in uh, dire circumstances absolutely expect everything to be done uh, as soon as possible and have uh, little sense of the time frame that some of these things will take. You know, for instance, if you wanted to build a house today uh, on a BAU basis, uh, you know, you'd be looking at, uh, you know, a year or more for that to happen. So, you know, in terms of getting rebuild, uh, remember we've got, uh, we're going to be waiting weeks before some Bailey bridges are, uh, are in place for uh, access into uh, areas. You've got to get tradies into the, in the areas. So there's a, a, a real sort of big question for, you know, New Zealand Inc. in terms of how do we get the resources in, the skills and trades that we do need, uh, if there are any shortages in any areas, and how do we get that access into these remote regions? Um, so, yeah, the question is, is everybody's got to be challenged. Uh, we, you know, we've just got to look at the time frames. We will do uh, better uh, than we did in Christchurch. We've learned a lot of lessons from that and as to how, to, how we deal with issues. But uh, I don't want to put a rosy picture on this and say that we can just magic this overnight. There are some very complex uh, Okay, Tim, claims, what are the lessons uh, you've learned from yeah. Christchurch in, in terms of claims processing and the systems that companies might use? Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things in Christchurch, uh, one of the crazy things that used to happen was, you know, uh, and remember that was an earthquake, people would have to, uh, first of all, put a claim into the Earthquake Commission. The Earthquake Commission would then get in touch uh, with the insurer and say, are they insured? Because if they're insured, they get Earthquake Commission cover. And then the, the EQC in those days would then go around, uh, assess uh, the damage to the property, uh, and then uh, decide when it became what was called overcap, over $100,000 in those days. It's uh, uh, much higher than that today. Uh, and then uh, uh, if it went over that, then they would hand over to the insurer and it would, the whole process would start again. Um, so, uh, you know, what happens now uh, in this event where there's land damage, uh, so insurers will be uh, managing the claim on behalf of the EQC so the customer has one point of contact and accountability, their insurer, uh, and all that stuff uh, behind the scenes is dealt through uh, the insurer and EQC without troubling uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the policy uh, holder. The customer. Do we also yeah, appreciate, uh, Tim, that some people, they've got no access to the internet, the documents yeah. they might have had for the insurance have been destroyed. Yeah. They might not be able to get it to a phone. They're kind of stuffed, aren't they? Well, uh, if you're in that, those circumstances and you know that you're insured, um, if you can contact a uh, friend, family, or even yeah. a neighbour or somebody next to you and say, look, I want to phone uh, my insurer... Uh, if you phone your insurer and tell them, uh, this is my address, I lost all my documents, mm. uh, uh, the insurer will know absolutely uh, the uh, insurance uh, cover on your property. Uh, and uh, the other thing I'd urge people to do is also call out if they're uh, you know, facing vulnerability. Uh, you know, people have uh, all sorts of different circumstances, so it's important for us to be able to prioritise those who are facing mm. vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, so th that'll be another call out. So borrow somebody's phone. Uh, if you can't, haven't got a phone, uh, and if you can ask them to take some pics or something like that, and so you can get, uh, have some uh, 
uh, you know, good evidence to get the uh, claims process underway all well and good. Mm. Otherwise, you know, I mean, it's not always easy to do that, uh, especially for some people in some of the uh, regions at the moment. So, you know, when you can do that, but I know after a catastrophe, people are only thinking about the immediate sort of the necessities yeah. of life and yeah. insurance comes a little bit later. Yeah, Tim, have you guys done any work on overall liability of insurers in New Zealand for, for the Gabriel severe weather event? Can you put... And, and yeah, I know in some ways it's dollars. only meaningless. You know, how in dollar terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but I, I mean, if I can give you an, uh, an example. So as I said last year, record year for insurance losses from extreme weather, uh, about 35,000 claims and about $350 million in insurance losses. Uh, I've already kind of indicated that we're going to be well over that. Uh, so this will run into hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, but uh, we, 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 it'll be a, a little time before we get uh, estimates mm. on, on the total amount. Yeah. And, and further out, there's no way you have an event this big and it doesn't affect premiums. And in some cases, yeah. will it affect the insurability of, of properties and other things? It before even before these two events, uh, there were some significant head, headwinds uh, on uh, premiums. Uh, first of all, the reinsurance costs uh, around the world uh, are the toughest they've been in over a decade. Uh, you remember record flooding in Australia uh, last year, Hurricane Ian hitting Florida. So lots of big events have really made it tight in the reinsurance world. That comprises about 20% of your insurance premium. So that's been going north. Uh, on top of that, we've had you know not just standard inflation, but construction inflation running at between 15 and 20%. So when it comes to housing and, and replacing housing, uh, you've got that inflation in there. There's also been an adjustment uh, through this year to the uh, Earthquake Commission uh, uh, cap going up to 300,000, which means that properties in low seismic areas like, uh, for instance, Auckland, are facing uh, overall uh, an increase uh, just from that change. Uh, so all of that was happening before this event, uh, and then therefore this event as well is going to put pr pressure on um, uh, premiums, uh, and uh, you know it's over to each insurer to decide where they would want to insure in future. Which is why we've been saying, you know, uh, urging a uh, consideration of how we uh, build back better or relocate in some areas. Um, yeah, I mean, the I've prime minister has talked about tough decisions. Are we just going to have to look at some communities or some pieces of infrastructure and say, got to change that? Too vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you look back 1935, Aston Valley, um, you know, devastating floods and silt and the pictures there from that, that time look very similar to today. Uh, you look at Murawai 1965, I think it was, a uh, major landslip there. Um, and, and we look at the very similar pictures today. So, you know, what we ought not to do is to uh, get everything back together to the, exactly the way it was, uh, only to have with you know more frequent and impactful climate uh, events uh, repeating uh, in a few years' time what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. I hear you, Tim. Look, thank you. That was a very comprehensive um, interview, um, and uh, I, I thank you for, for giving that direction, particularly to the people who are in, in the most stressed and vulnerable uh, situations uh, right now. Tim, thanks very much indeed. No worries, Sean. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Tim Grafton there, the Chief Executive of the Insurance Council. So if you've gotten short, even if you've lost your documents, grab a phone, call your company. OK, he says we've learned some lessons. You're not going to have to do the go-between between EQC and the insurance company. Thank goodness for that. Um, geez, I just hope they've got enough people to, to, in a timely fashion, process all the claims that are coming through. But he's talking... Well, I think he's actually he says hundreds of millions. I reckon they'll get to a billion. The government estimating it'll be a thirteen and a half billion dollar event in terms of cost to the country. Who knows how long is a piece of string, but it's a biggie. There's no doubt it is a biggie. I understand a Rahui in place for the Hawks Bay. I hope that doesn't stop rescue search and recovery people from doing the stuff they have got to do.